What a marvelous hymn. Come ye faithful, raise the string. One of my favorite uh, Easter and post-Easter hymns. Welcome to First United Church of Christ. What, a, what is, again, a delightful uh, spring day. I can look outside and still see the remaining daffodils and a lot of other flowers beginning to uh, peek their noses up. Beautiful crab apple tree in bloom, and certainly a marvelous cherry tree. The cherry was kind of an interesting story because it was a rescue tree. I, I think Kathleen brought it home in the back of her old Taurus station wagon, bought it for about $7, and now it's probably uh, the most gorgeous tree in our backyard. It is a, a story, I guess, in some respect of, of rebirth. I think it's important to remind ourselves of those things on occasion. Let's begin our worship with our call to worship. Rise and greet the morning. Cast off your sleep and doubt. Arise, meet the risen Christ. The Christ who comforts our grieving hearts, who encourages our faltering steps, who splinters us with laughter, who wrinkles us with compassion, who raises us to heaven. Rise and sing your praise. Beloved, one of the great gifts we have is to know that we are, are God's children. We know that God loves us. And yet we also know that we sometimes fail to respond appropriately to that love. And so, let's confess our sins together. <clears throat> Merciful and loving God, your love for us, your love for us is unconditional. And yet, our love for you and others and for ourselves is, is often marred. We allow prejudice and pride to, to blind us. Our brokenness remains unhealed. We, we cling to old stories and hurts which, which impede the work of reconciliation. Forgive us, we pray, for failing to trust you, for playing the safe rather than following the daring call of your spirit, for withholding forgiveness and grace from ourselves and from each other. Let your love renew us yet again. Let the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead rekindle creative life within us and restore relate, bright relations among us. Amen. We know love by this, that Jesus laid down his life for us. Hear the good news and believe that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven and we can sing Alleluia. Amen. And we can also sing Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. You know, often, remarkable words of wisdom come down to us over the centuries. As we pray our prayer for illumination this morning, remember that these, these words came to us from the, from the fourth century, from St. Jerome. And they're just as valid today as they were in the, third, in the fourth century. St. Jerome wrote this, Lord, you have given us your word as, as a light to shine upon our path. And so grant us to meditate on that word and to follow its teaching, that we might find in it the light that shines more and more until that perfect day. We pray this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we enter the church year, or the period of the church year that follows Easter, uh, we begin our readings from the book of Acts. And here we hear Peter standing strongly and bravely in the crowd. And he says this, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, and for your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. With many other words he warned them and pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted this message were baptized. About 3,000 were added this very day. 
Now we read from the testimony of Peter. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but rather with the precious blood of Christ, the Lamb, without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who was raised, who raised him from the dead land glor and glorified him, and so, your faith, and, and so your faith and your hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you may have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. Our gospel lesson today comes from the Gospel of Luke, and I'm including it in my sermon. But it's indeed a very famous and familiar story to us on the road to Emmaus. <coughs> you know, one of the oldest and, 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 and I think funniest devices in comedy is that of mistaken identity. You know, we love to see it on the screen, but, but it also happens in real life. And it's often a source of, of, of laughter and confusion. And a fellow wrote into Reader's Digest about his father-in-law. His father-in-law was named Eugene. And one day, Eugene was in a restaurant uh, having lunch with a number of his business associates and when a very distinguished-looking gentleman rushed up to his table. He was hardly able to contain his enthusiasm, and he grabbed Gene's hand and began to pump it vigorously, all the while addressing him as, as Joe. He was fondly recalling the great, team, great times they had together in, in the Army. Well, Eugene surely wasn't Joe. He had served in the Merchant Marines and not the Army, and he gently told this very enthusiastic and very distinguished gentleman that, that, that he was mistaken, that he obviously confused him with someone else. And the stranger was obviously embarrassed and uh, apologized profusely and, and left. The fellow writing tells us that a, that a week later, while sitting in the same restaurant, Eugene bumped into that same stranger again, and this time the stranger hugged him and repeated with an ear, to everyone with an earshot all the poignant stories of the great adventures they had when, when they were buddies in the army. And they simply hadn't seen each other for years and years and years. And, and finally, before Eugene could speak a word, he said, you know, it was absolutely amazing. You're never going to believe this. But I, made some, I met some guy here last week, and he looks just like you. Well, you know, I think we can understand what's going on. He hadn't seen his old army buddy for, for, for years, maybe a generation. Uh, you know, we can understand that. We, we can put ourselves in, that, in the same situation. We can understand what was going on because we've probably had cases of mistaken identity ourselves. I can understand this fellow. But, but how in the world do you, do you explain Mary Magdalene at, at the empty tomb as we read two weeks ago? How is Mary Magdalene, one of Jesus' closest associates, why didn't she recognize the risen Christ? That's the same question about the two folks walking along the road to Emmaus. They're talking with Christ. They walked seven miles with Christ. And, and, and they didn't recognize him. How, how in the world do you explain that? It's, it's a marvelous record, as Luke shares it with us. Luke's the only one who shares this particular, uh, this particular episode. He tells us that it was on that, that first Sunday, that the first Easter Sunday, the first day of the week, and... Uh, Jesus had been re resurrected, but, but he hadn't really shown himself to, to all of the disciples yet. And so two of them are, are headed out of Jerusalem. Uh, they're going toward a, a village called, called Emmaus. It was about a seven-mile journey, a small, tiny little, little suburb of J Jerusalem. And they're talking to each other about all the stuff that had gone on uh, the previous few days. They, they talked and discussed these things with each other. And, and all of a sudden, a stranger, we know it's Jesus, comes up and walks along with them and Remarkably, they're his disciples, and yet they didn't recognize him. The Living Bible translates it this way, but God kept them from recognizing him. Now, <laughs> uh, we talked about that the other night in our Bible study. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Of course, it was always interesting to me, you know. What, was this some kind of test? What was, what was going on? Christ asked them, what are you discussing together as you're walking along on the road? And, 
the two disciples stopped. The record says their eyes were downcast, and one of them, uh, named Cleopas, a name we haven't heard before, asked, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem to do not know the things that have happened here in the past few days? What things, the stranger asked. Well, about Jesus of Nazareth. You know, he was a prophet. He was powerful in the word and deed before God and all the people. Uh, the chief priests and, and the rulers, they handed him over to be sentenced to death, and, and they crucified him. We had hoped that, that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it's the third day since all this stuff took place, and in addition, some of our women absolutely amazed us with an incredible story. They went to the tomb early this morning, and, and, and they didn't find a body. And they came and they told us that, that they'd seen a vision of angels, and, and, and the angels said he was alive. And then, then some of our men companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said. But they didn't see him. And so now the risen Christ says to them, How foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe that all the to believe all the prophet all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And then Luke says, He began with Moses and all the prophets and explained to them all that was said in the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to, to which they were going, approached to Emmaus, Jesus acted as if he was going on, on further. But, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening and the day's almost over. So, so he went in to stay with them, and, and they had a meal together. And then Luke tells us that while he was at table, uh, he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them. You know, remarkably familiar words, aren't they? He took bread and broke it and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and, and, and they recognized him, and then he disappeared from their sight. Then they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And so immediately they get back on the road, head back to Jerusalem, and there they meet the other disciples who told them, it's true. The Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened to them and how they recognized Jesus when he had broken the bread. Fascinating story. And several things I, I think seem to pop up that are obvious from this story. First of all, there's additional evidence to support something we, we noted on Easter and we noted again last week. The disciples really weren't expecting Jesus to rise from the grave. You know, he told them he would. He tried to prepare them about it. He repeated it continuously and yet as we said in a Bible study the other night, these knuckleheads didn't have a clue. They were confused. They were grieving. We even know that they were hiding, and some were beginning to scatter. Uh, maybe they were, they were fearful. They, they thought their lives might be in danger, too. And the two disciples in our story had, had left Jerusalem. They were heading to, to Emmaus, a seven-mile hike. They were defeated. Their lives, their dreams, their hopes, their desires were, were in dust. And they figured... It's time to get out of town. It's time to get away, to, to reflect on the future. What are we going to do with our lives now? Are we going to go back to fishing or farming or, or whatever they'd done before Christ had called them? You know, the very last thing that could have entered their imaginations was that they would meet the risen Christ on the road along with them. But, but doesn't that happen? Just when we think the world's caved in on us, when there's no point to it all, Aren't those sometimes the times we, we encounter Christ? Pastor Glenn Barnes tells a story uh, from his First Baptist Church in, in Lodi, California, and it comes at a time when the AIDS rampage was, was going across the face of the earth, and he talks about an absolutely incredible experience, almost unbelievable experience he had at, at that time. He said, he said the church was hosting a, a couple of visitors, uh, two women from Lesotho, South Africa, and he said that two women had an incredible ministry. They're caring for the poor and the sick in South Africa. Um, they were curing, caring especially for those who, who suffered from AIDS. And he said, as you looked at the women, you could see that this ministry was taking a, a terrible toll on them, physically, emotionally, spiritually. In fact, one of the women shared with him that, that, that in confidence that, that she was ready to, 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 to quit. 
She was tired of struggling. She was tired of feeling burned out. She was wondering, you know, really should I be moving on to doing something else? And as they talked about trying to hear God's voice, she said, you know, sometimes, sometimes I just wish that God would write on the sky. Then I'd know whether I was doing God's work or not. Well, <laughs> Barnes says later that very same day, uh, the two ladies went on a little sightseeing tour of San Francisco, and they, they went out on a boat into San Francisco Bay, and it is a beautiful bay. And they went to Alcatraz, and, and, and they were under, standing under the Golden Gate Bridge, and it was absolutely gorgeous, uh, they said. About halfway out on their journey, that they heard a rumbling in the sky, and they looked up, and right above them flew the Blue Angels, that marvelous acrobatic team of, of, of Navy jets. And the two women were absolutely terrified. They had no idea what was going on. They wondered if whether they were under attack, under military attack. And, and Barnes said, I assured them that it was just a, just a show. And as part of that, you know, that magnificent, incredible demonstration, uh, if you've seen them, it is absolutely breathtaking. One of the planes took off over the city. It, it turned its smoke stream on, and then all of a sudden it turned on the afterburners and went absolutely vertical. The noise was absolutely incredible, and it, it began skywriting. What it wrote wasn't a word or, or a sentence or a symbol what we typically think of as skywriting. That jet let a floating written message in the sky. It was as big, it was a great big enormous AIDS ribbon. Now just think about that. This big enormous AIDS ribbon flying out of a jet, flying at incredible speeds, nearly vertical. The noise was, was incredible. And, and Barnes said he, he looked over at his new friend and she was struggling with that work back home and she was worried and concerned and tired about dealing with, with AIDS sufferers. And he said, I had chills up and down my spine as I saw that ribbon appear in the clouds. He said, I looked at her and there were tears rolling down her cheeks. She said, it seemed as if God had taken this particular occasion He'd literally written his answer in the sky for her. What a, what a phenomenal experience. You know, I, I don't think most of us have, have had that dramatic kind of experience, but, but maybe we've had an experience where God's spoken to us. So. Sometimes when we thought we were at the end of our rope, when, when we thought we were just barely hanging on, and then maybe somebody said something, a friend said something, you, you, know, you saw something, you heard a song, you heard a, a, a poem, you, you read a book, and you realize that that was a message from God. It seems as if God was speaking directly to you. Now, now I'm sure that this happens most often to folks who are believers. You have to notice that, that as we read Luke's record in particular, uh, after Jesus' resurrection, he really only showed himself to those who believed in him. And I think that's true in our lives as well. If it, if you've surrounded yourself with a veil of skepticism, it might be remarkably difficult to hear God talking to you. But if in your time of trial you, you ask God to show himself to you, we might be remarkably well surprised that that prayer will be answered. Now, the good news we get is that God is not dead, that God's not buried in the ground. God is alive and God is with us. Now that's what Cleopas and his friend discovered on the road to Emmaus. They were discouraged, they were downhearted, they were defeated, and just as they were ready to give up, they encountered the Master. I said the other night that uh, I've been a fan of astronomy since I was, I was a young, young boy. I remember going to the Hayden Planetarium in New York City when I was four or five years old with my folks. I remember back in 1972, I was fascinated by, by the space program, and NASA uh, launched a, an exploratory uh, space probe called Pioneer 10. And the goal of Pioneer 10 was, was to fly close to Jupiter and take pictures of that planet and its moons and, and whip around by the, the power of the gravitational pull of Jupiter and accelerate and take a grand tour of the other planets and take pictures of those planets as well. Kind of interesting that NASA wasn't even really sure if that probe would ever even get to Jupiter. They, they didn't know what would happen if it, it went across the asteroid belt. That was the greatest distance any spacecraft had ever traveled. They thought it might be banged up as it went through the asteroid belt. Well, Pioneer 10 completed its mission in, in, in 1973, and it continued to travel onto space. And I think we see periodic stories uh, about the, the Pioneer and then the Mariner probes as, as well. Uh, by uh, 2022, 
the, the probe had traveled uh, 12 billion miles away from the sun. It had gone out, out, out past the Oort cloud. It was in interstellar space. And even there, it's beginning to discover some new things that, that are unexplained to the, to the NASA scientists. What's also fascinating to me is that despite this enormous distance, a tiny little 8-watt transmitter is able to be heard over the, those 12 billion miles. You know, it's, a, it's a tiny... There's not much power in that. That's not much power in that transmitter at all. It's about as powerful as, as a nightlight. It takes the, the signal 18 hours to get here. Remarkable story. You know, I, I look at the pictures that come from the James Webb uh, Telescope, Space Telescope, and, and they're absolutely incredible. You know, we, we, we thought that uh, you know, what we had seen from from space before was remarkable. These pictures are, are, are beyond belief. Billions of galaxies with billions of stars and billions of planets proves to me, anyway, that God is not dead, that God's remarkably alive in the universe. It, it, it's kind of amazing to me that a generation takes for granted the, the, the remarkable wonders in space and then dismisses the idea of the power of God. The Creator put all this in motion. He tells us that God is alive, that God is personal, that God cares about you, that God cares, desires to reveal himself to us, just as Christ revealed himself to those two, two travelers on, on, on the road to Emmaus. And of course, one of the places that happens is at worship. Notice how, how the story ends. Uh, then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and then he disappeared from their sight, and they asked each other, were not our hearts burning with us while we talk, while he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And then, then they got up and departed at once and returned to Jerusalem. And there they found the eleven and the others with them, and they assembled together and said, It's true. The Lord has risen. He's appeared to, the, he's appeared to Simon. And then the two told, told their story and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. You know, I think that's important. I think it's important that, that, that they recognize Christ when, when, he, when he opened the scriptures to them and, and, and when he broke the bread. It would be impossible to ignore the link between this experience of the disciples and, and the preaching of the word and the taking of the sacrament in worship, would it? Where do you most often find Christ? Where is the word preached and, and the sacrament served? You know, I know some folks who say, can I... I can find God on a golf course, and I guarantee you probably can find God on a golf course. You might also get struck by lightning on a golf course. No. But we know that God is in the sanctuary when, when we worship together, when the bread is broken. And I think that's when we're most likely to, to encounter Christ. I remember going to, to Riverside Church in, in New York City. I uh, remember it was right next to, at that point, Juilliard School. And the late Harry Emerson Fosdick was, was the pastor there. And he identified four motives for, for people for attending church. Uh, he said, some people go to church just because it's a, it's a decent thing to do. Some attend because they're fans of a part of the service. Uh, some like the music or the choir, the Baptist, maybe they like the preacher, could be. Some go because they think church attendance would accrue some benefit for them. They might look better for, for attending church service. Uh, some people go to church because they think worship is some kind of glorified self-medication uh, that, that they'll be better once, once they've been there. And Fosdick concluded there's some good to be found in, in each of those things. But I think there's a better reason to go to church. It, it is to find God. Or better yet, to open ourselves to God and, uh, and open ourselves to the God that's searching for us. Robert McCracken, who, who followed uh, Fosdick uh, at, at Riverside, was asked his opinion of, of why people came to church. And he thought for a moment and said, They come hoping to hear some word from beyond themselves. They come hoping to hear some word beyond themselves. I, I hope that's why you're listening to this fireside worship. I hope that's why you attend church on Sunday morning, or why you listen to us on our, on our podcasts, to hear some word from beyond yourself. You know, it's fine to be here because you like the music, or because you think it's the thing to do, or you, you like to, to sit down with some folks and, and have a good time. Maybe you like the, the, the preacher's message one Sunday morning. That's okay. But, but 
So think about our sanctuary, having been there for, for 286 years. You have the echoes of eternity in, in, in that room. When the scriptures are read, when the bread is broken, when, when we bow in supplication before, before the throne of God, God is here. So let's open ourselves to God and hear God speak to our hearts. Amen. Here we take a moment to affirm our faith together. As an Easter people, we believe that God is Lord of both life and death. We believe that is an astounding act of grace. Jesus suffered and died on the cross to save us from our sins. We believe three days later, Jesus was raised from the dead, promising us salvation. Not because we deserve it, but out of love, through grace. And we believe that we're called to respond to that gift of grace, not out of duty, but out of gratitude. To seek peace, to care for the ill, to clothe the naked, feed the hungry, empower the oppressed, and welcome the outcast. To carry on Christ's work uh, until he comes again. Because... As an Easter people, we are confident that Christ will come again. Alleluia. Amen. May we bow our heads in prayer. Wondrous and generous God, your gifts are overwhelming. Your sun lights the way for our journey and your stars puncture our darkness. Your living water quenches our thirst and your broken bread opens the door to eternal life. Your healing touch binds up our wounds and your forgiveness washes us clean from sin. Wondrous and generous God, from the four corners of the earth, the chorus of praise erupts. The oceans roar and the trees shout their joy. From the deepest depths of our being, our prayer gropes to find words of adoration. For you are patient and kind, even as we wander. Even as we are lured by the trivial and attracted by the quick solution. For your, pardon me, thought I was going to sneeze. <coughs> I was going to sneeze. For you are full of compassion and truth. Even as we stumble in relationships and hesitate at the doors of justice, you are there with us. Come now, wondrous and generous God. Bring comfort to those who agonize over broken relationships, who mourn the death of what used to be. Touch those whose bodies need healing. Liberate those whose abductions warp their full potential. Surprise those whose days are filled with sameness and whose joy has ceased. Come now, wondrous and generous God. Make this church a place where seeds grow and joy is shared and songs are sung. Where peace is shaped and dreams are born. Where sorrow is graced and ripples of love spread. Father, today in particular we ask your, your blessing on our memories of, of David Freitag. As he passed away this this this, this week, we uh, we thank also of of Beth, of Beth, Lam Beth Lambert. We, we think of those people whose lives have been torn apart by by tornadoes and by, by hurricanes and by earthquakes and by war and by guns. We ask your blessing upon all of them. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's pray the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May pray a prayer of dedication. Thanks be to thee, O God. Thanks be to thee for all good gifts and especially for your inexpressible gift of your Lord, your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to see where we have been blessed, and empower us to be a blessing to others. Amen. And now for a benediction and our final hymn of worship. As you go from this place, my friends, remember this. No matter where you walk, God is with you. As you travel through the deepest valleys and struggle to the highest mountain, Christ walks with you. Take heart in the fact that wherever you go, Christ has already been there, and so it shall be forever. Amen.